Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Your show originally aired on the Premier Network on uh, Sunday, August 12th, 2018. This is episode 1514. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by WordPress. Reach more customers when you build your business website on WordPress.com. Plans start at just $4 a month, and you can get 15% off any new plan at WordPress.com slash Tech Guy. Oh, hi. How are you? Good to see you. Welcome. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Come on in. Come on in. Let me. Get, would you like a cup of coffee, a cup of tea? This is the... <laughs> it would be kind of fun, wouldn't it, if you could just come in here and have a seat and I'd give you a little, little uh, warm beverage and we could talk about tech, a little, little bit about computers, maybe the internet. You know, we could talk about, uh, I don't know, home theater. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about there, and uh, smartphones, smart watches, all that stuff. That's what we do on the show. You can call in. I wish you could come in and visit, but uh, since you can't, you just can call it, and we'll and we'll we'll pretend we're sipping a cup of warm tea. The phone number is or iced tea today, huh? Yeah, eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number eight 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 two seven. 5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you could still call. You just use Skype or something and Skype out. You're calling a toll free number. Shouldn't cost you anything. 8888 Ask Leo. Website is techhighlabs.com. So if we do have a little chat about something you're interested in, you can find all the links and the information at the website. It's free. There's no sign up. Tech Guy Labs. Tech Guy Labs dot com. Speaking of smartphones, Samsung announced its. Galaxy Note 9 this week, and it's going to be out in a, in a week or two. What did they say, the 24th? Something like that. The Galaxy, you can pre-order right now. Uh, if you have ever had a Note, you probably, you know, no, the Note phone is one of those phones that people just, like, are devoted to, right? Fans of. And then there's people who say, ah, oh, that thing is huge. It's huge. I'm not going to, I'm not going to dignify that with my purchase yeah, uh, they they those that type will be you know very gratified to learn that the, the Galaxy Note Nine is starts at one thousand dollars now. Ah, <sighs> yikes! And uh, goes up even higher if you want to get the new high storage version. So uh, it's but it's a beautiful phone, slightly larger than the uh, than the old Galaxy Note Eight. Big battery, and uh, I, that, I think, scares some people because it's funny how, I, I, for, at the time, I thought the exploding Note 7s would be a, a black mark on Samsung forever, that it would damage their reputation. They might even have to get out of the smartphone business, and boy, was I wrong. That didn't do anything, right? People forgot about it immediately, and that's, I guess, another testament to how much people love these Note phones. But the Note 8, because of the exploding Note 7, uh, had a kind of uh, small battery for a phone that size. It still got pretty good. I liked my uh, uh, Note 8. I've handed it down to my daughter now, who loves it. She's an artist. She likes the the stylus that they put in there, and she likes to draw on the screen. And uh, so Samsung has decided to go back to the big battery. 4,000 milliamp hours in the new Note. And uh, that's that is a that is the size I think of the Note Seven. That is a big battery, but they're putting in. They say they're putting in water cooling, <laughs> so it won't get too hot. We don't have to worry about it exploding. It's got a new active cooling uh, feature. So that's uh, the old the Note Eight was thirty three hundred milliamp hours. Now we're up to four thousand. That's actually larger than the Seven. It's the largest. A battery ever on a note and i i feel very confident i'm sure most of you do too samsung is not going to take a second chance on exploding batteries this will be <clears throat> a safe phone i think i know i know but boy uh 4, milliamp hours pretty impressive the reviewers because some of them have had it since tuesday since the the phone uh, was announced 
uh, are all reporting exceptional battery life. Really good, like 22-hour battery life. That's, that's nice. Now, $1,000 is going to scare people. In fact, that isn't even the most you can spend. That's for, this, for the... Uh, uh, you get a, a 6 gigs of RAM, which is a lot. Android phones usually don't have that much. 6 gigs of... They, they seem to operate better with that, so that's good. 6 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage. And don't forget, you can still put an SD card in these. Samsung says, we even now have 512 gigabyte SD cards. So storage is not the issue on these. If you if you want more, though, <laughs> you could spend a, a breathtaking $1,300 on this phone and get 8 gigs of RAM and half a terabyte of storage built in. That's why you might see the ads that say, now with a terabyte, you could get a half terabyte built in for 1300 bucks, then spend another few hundred dollars. I don't know what the 512 card will cost, but probably, you know, 300 bucks, And uh, you could have a terabyte of storage in your phone. Who would have thunk that? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't, I can't imagine anybody need that much. But if you know, if you do, I guess. Frankly, I think 64 gigs is plenty on a phone, especially if you could put an SD card in there and expand it as, as needed. Usually the SD cards, the little uh, micro SD cards you put in there, you put data on. You, in some cases, you could put applications on there. I wouldn't. I think the operating system and applications, 64 gigs is plenty. Then you could put a little SD card in there for your music and photos and videos and stuff like that. And, of course, this is a Samsung, so you will be taking a lot of photos and videos. It's got another great camera as as samsung is known for it also as the note is known for has one of these s pen styluses they're, they're they come in color now there's a lavender s pen with the lavender phone and a yellow s pen with the blue phone so it's like little boy scout colors the s pen though well it remains to be seen they may have made a mistake on the s pen it is bluetooth le and can be used as a remote control. So they envision you maybe using it to control a slideshow off your phone. Or, yeah, uh, maybe the more likely use is as a uh, selfie camera button. So you can use the S Pen to take a picture. So you can put your camera on a tripod or on a wall or somewhere, step back, take a picture, family photo, and use the, the S Pen as the shutter control. So that's kind of neat. But in order to do that... Now the pen is now an active pen. It needs battery. It's got a supercharger in it, a super capacitor in there that charges fast, but it will only hold that charge for half an hour. So if you're out there sketching or taking notes with your S Pen, it'll die in half an hour. That's not so good. You can charge it up in 40 seconds. That's the super capacitor. But still, you're in the middle of a meeting. I never have been in a business meeting yet that's less than an hour. Halfway through it, you have to you just have to say, stop, hold on, I can't take any more notes. I'm going to put my pen in the charger. Everybody take a minute. Mm. Eh. Uh. I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are some really nice features in low-light photography. It's It's got a dual aperture camera, a digital, I'm sorry, optical image stabilization on the rear camera. That's what you want. Super wide angle. It's 12 megapixels. That's plenty. We're learning now that you don't need 40 megapixels on a camera phone. 12 is fine. 8 megapixel on the front. Very fast front lens, 1.7. F-stop, 1.7. Uh, there's lots of software. Nowadays, it's not really the, the hardware that makes a camera phone so good. It's the software. And, and Samsung's really good at this. Super slow-mo, all that stuff they put in the S9. I'm uh, I'm excited. I think this will be a very nice phone for Note lovers. Oh, and Samsung continues to prove Apple and, and Google wrong by including a headphone jack. Apple said, there's just not enough room in a modern phone for a headphone jack. We just had to take it out to put all the good stuff we put in there. Samsung says, wait a minute, we put a pen in, we put fingerprint and face recognition, we put everything in there, dual speakers, everything, and still have room for a headphone jack. What, what are you talking about, Apple? Honestly, at this point, the reason I buy a Samsung phone, all the you know great features, the beautiful screen, the excellent cameras, it's really the headphone jack. I want a headphone jack, and if you do, that's, you know, you're going to be getting an S9, which is an excellent phone, or the Note... 
Nine, which is the leader in technology for Samsung, and it's coming out. You can pre-order now, and I think it's coming out in a couple of weeks. I wonder what the date is. I'll have to look and see. I don't remember off the top of my head. The 24th, 29th, something like that. When you pre-order, they'll tell you. And, uh, of course, some a lot of you will probably try to buy it through your carrier, so that'll be up to the carrier when they get it to you. Pretty nice phone, Samsung. Well done. I don't think it'll be exploding. I hope not. 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. I'm here. I'm here to help. I'm here to take your call. Call Kim Schaffer. Let's get you on the air, and we'll do that right after this. Oh, Ozzy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. There she is, Kim Schaffer. What are you laughing at? Oh. Ozzy cracks me up. I know. They have those reality shows with his family Sharon, traveling. I can't use the remote, Sharon. Well, it's not even that. Now he's traveling with his son, Jack. They're like on road trips. and Oh, I, he's uh, still doing that? Yeah. They called it the Osbournes. I remember yeah, seeing that no, years ago. It's a, it's a new series. Ozzy and Jack Ozzie and on Jack, the road? On the road, yeah. It's it's rather endearing <laughs> when they're swearing at each other. <laughs> oh, I got to remember. <laughs> It's pretty funny. I do remember uh, Jack from the show. Yeah, He's grown well, up Jack now, Jack was I a mess back then, but yeah. he has grown up. He got married, had some kids, now he's divorced. But, Ozzy um, and Jack, the yeah. world tour. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's a fun little show. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. He used to be, you know, because he was the lead singer of Black Sabbath. That was the song we were playing. No, when he bit... He used... Yeah, people were scared bats, of him. And, bats and heads and off. Parents would say, you can't listen to that. That's the devil's music. Yeah. And it turns out he's just kind of... <laughs> kind of doofus. He's a complete goofball. <laughs> he's not scary. Not at all. He's a goof. <laughs> he's a puffy little goofball. <laughs> puffy. So, uh, I think we should take some tech calls though. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Charles in Colleyville, Texas. He needs a way to manage his vast array of MP3s. You you um you like to make me work, don't you? Yeah. Well, yeah. somebody has to. You, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> it's not me. You like to crack the whip. You give me these tough calls. Not, I, Can we at, have some cream puffs today, well, look please? At, look at the first call I, oh. on the board. I think that the, I was oh. throwing you a softball. <laughs> oh, you're right. We'll get to Lewis in a bit. But first, Charles, Colleyville, Texas. Hello, Charles. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking the call. My pleasure. I have a Windows 10 PC with about a thousand MP3s that I've collected over the years. Some of them I've ripped myself, some of them I've downloaded from iTunes, others I've downloaded from Amazon. And I neatly put them in uh, the music folder by artist, by song, everything's neat. Uh, except uh, my Apple phones don't like that. They, they like to use the iTunes folder. Oh, so all my music is copied into that as well. And now I have multiple copies of all the songs so that when I play my Sonos or when I play the Plex server, it sees you know four or five different copies of the song. Yeah, it's too late now. There was a way to avoid that. In the You're using iTunes. That's the problem. And it would terrible, terrible right. program. But in the iTunes settings, you can say, let me manage my music. Don't you manage your music? So there's two ways iTunes will do that. One is they what you did, which is it copies it all into the iTunes folder. But you can say, no, no, leave the songs where they are. And, but you just didn't do that before you imported it. So if you really wanted to at this point, one thing you could do is delete the iTunes music folder. That'll delete the duplicate. You still have, make sure you still have all your originals. But delete the duplicate or maybe even yes. move it. Actually, smartest thing would not be delete it, but just move it somewhere else so iTunes can't find it. Right. Then iTunes, when you open it, will say, I got nothing. <laughs> no songs. Then before you do the input, go into the settings and say, let me manage my music. Don't move the music. And when you do that, uh, iTunes will just leave the song where it is in your own nicely organized folders, but add it to the iTunes index, which is a file that it keeps in the in the music folder. And that index tells it where to find the songs. So you don't have to accept their choice. Right. I, I did use Music Match uh, last year. Oh, and I still that might. That. Yeah, I don't know if Music Match changes that. It shouldn't. It shouldn't, but it might, you know, because Music Match is, uh, which is worth it. It's $25. A year, it's uh, it, it, I, Apple confuses everybody by selling that and Apple Music, but Music Match is really for people like you who have a collection of music, and then Music Match will 
uh, either upload copies of songs it doesn't know about or or just verify that you own a song it has in the cloud, and now your entire collection is in the cloud. And that's another way you can sync to your phone. You can just download it directly to your phone without connecting to your computer. Right. I don't know if so, Music Match wants to move, move your music. I, I, I guess it wouldn't. I would hope it wouldn't. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. In the iTunes folder, there's iTunes Media and then there's iTunes Music, both of which have music folders in them. So I'm really confused about what that's what that's doing. Uh, media is videos, and there's music videos. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, let me look and just you now see you're using Windows. I don't. I think uh, my strong advice to everybody is do not use iTunes on Windows. iTunes on Mac is bad <laughs> enough. Um, yeah, the new. Uh, so you had an older version of iTunes, which called that folder iTunes Music. The new name is iTunes Media, and within that folder. It will have a number of other folders, including a music folder. Music. And I also have the iTunes music folder. Yeah, that's so. old. You can get rid of okay. that. That's from older versions of iTunes, put it in a music folder. And then in, okay. I can't remember when, maybe iTunes 10 or 11, they started just putting it all in a media folder. iTunes is a terrible program. I, I wish <laughs> people would wake up and do something about so it. So just because you're using it because you have an iPhone. But you don't have to right. use it. There are other programs that will sync to the iPhone. I've, I've often recommended Double Twist, which really is a good program for for syncing. It's free, I believe, uh, unless he started to charge for it. DoubleTwist.com. It's for syncing to uh, iOS or Android. It'll do much of the same thing without iTunes. And then instead, on Windows, instead of using iTunes, I strongly recommend Media Monkey. Uh, Media Monkey will handle your library smoothly and it'll even look up things like album art and populate it. It, might, it can help you reorganize it. A lot of times when you uh, download songs, you know, they, you don't get the album information and so forth. It'll help you organize it into the albums as you wish. It'll play any format music, more formats than iTunes will. So that's a nice one, but I don't want to confuse iTunes. So turn out, you know, set that switch in iTunes. It says, let me manage my music, iTunes. Don't you be so helpful. I'll take care of that. I'm not sure where that is. Uh, on the um, on the Windows version of iTunes, but in, I'll look uh, for it. yeah, it's it's actually right in general on the Apple version. It says add songs to library when adding songs to playlist. That's what you want to uncheck that. You don't want to. Uh, let me see. Uh, Cloud Music Library. Yeah, maybe they moved it around. Yeah, you'll find it. It's in there somewhere. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Add songs to library. No, that's not it. I guess it's not in the general. It's probably in advanced. Right? Probably in advanced. Yeah. There it is. Under advanced, you can say where the media folder is, but uncheck keep iTunes media folder organized. Place files into album and artist folders and name the files based on the disk number, track number. Nope. And uncheck that. And uncheck copy files to iTunes media folder when adding the library. Nope. Don't don't manage my don't manage my stuff, Apple. And then if you uncheck those two, keep me iTunes media folder organized and copy files to media folder. If you uncheck those, undel automatically delete watch movies, share iTunes XML. Yeah, that's fine. If you undelete, if you uncheck those and then move, you'll have to move both the music and the media folder for this to work because don't delete them just in case. Here's why you probably have still a music folder, even though, as you can see, media is what iTunes names it now. Um... It continued to use music when you upgraded, but then you imported some songs and it put it in media. So you have both. So those two folders may not be identical. It's kind of a mess. Yeah, it's kind of an ugly, ugly situation. Yeah, Spotify... Well, they're going to test this in Australia. It doesn't mean it'll come here. We'll let you skip commercials in uh, the free tier. They say, and th we've seen this before. Uh, YouTube used to do that, lot, and sometimes still does. And uh, Dig did that, remember? Uh, and the reason is it tells advertisers uh, a lot about you. <laughs> if you skip their commercial, you're not interested. And so it helps them charge more, believe it or not, for commercials. Because if you're not skipping it, it means you're interested. And that's all advertisers care about is somebody who wants to see their commercial. I hope you're cruising around. Cruising around, listening to the radio with no particular place to go. 
on a Sunday. That sounds perfect to me, and I'm glad you chose the Tech Guy show to listen to. Leo Laporte here, 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. Lewis on the line from Hollywood. Hello, Lewis. Mr. President. <laughs> yes, uh, Lewis, it is good to talk to you once again. First, it was great to see the legendary Terry McGovern yesterday. Oh, yeah, so uh, you didn't see it on the radio show, uh, but during the break, Terry just popped his head in, and I, I was stunned. So you know you know the legend of, uh, the what, uh, really a San Francisco radio legend, but you might have seen him in many a movie. And, uh, of course, he's the voice of Droid 3 in Star Wars, the original Star Wars, the one who says, these aren't, or Star Trooper, Stand Trooper 3, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Uh, anyone who was in the Bay Area between the 60s and the yeah. 90s knew that voice. Oh, yeah. You couldn't change channels without hearing it. Oh, I love I mean, Terry. Yeah, four radio stations, what, six or seven uh, uh, four TV stations, six yeah. or seven radio stations. Yeah. Yeah. The, the poor man couldn't hang on to a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, he lives in Petaluma now, and I hope to see a lot more of him because he's, frankly, I idolize the guy. I mean, he's definitely one of my uh, radio inspirations. So. I I'd love to see him on Triangulation. Yeah, I think that's our interview show, and that's the first thing I'm going to try to get him to do, yeah. Leo, the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot of news coverage about um, 3D printed guns, people <laughs> using yeah. 3D printers to manufacture guns. The court case, forgive the pun, is moot. Uh, the plans are out there, and I was wondering your thoughts and if you see a technological solution. It's to an interesting, interesting question. So it started with this guy, Co Cody Wilson, who is a libertarian and a gun rights advocate and has a website called Defense Distributed. He created 3D plans for a 3D plastic gun uh, and, of course, immediately got in trouble with the courts. He has won his court case, by the way. So it's over. Uh, but... It isn't the terrible thing that you might assume it is, like, oh, bad guys or good guys or anybody's just going to run out, get a, a $200 3D printer and start making a usable gun. No. Uh, so a couple of issues. That plastic gun, in order to be legal, had to have one metal part. So he had, I think he had a metal trigger in it. So it would be still to be detected. Um, it is, I guess the most important point is this is an example of when when technology when something happens from technology people kind of freak out it has never been illegal to make your own gun you can you could have always been able to do that it's not illegal unless of course you can't you're not allowed to have a gun for a variety of reasons or you're making one of the restricted firearms like a you know a sawed off shotgun or something like that but you've always been able to to make a gun the real issue is to do this you know, you can buy a gun for a few hundred bucks. To do this, you need a very expensive CNC uh, milling machine, thousands of dollars. So if you really wanted a gun, the cheapest thing to do would be to go buy one. This is more, I, in my opinion, this is hobbyist. This is, uh, this is not criminals. Uh, you can even just steal a better gun, which is, in fact, what happens with, with most, uh, you know, most of the time guns used in, cr in crimes are stolen anyway or black market purchases. So this is, a, this is probably a moot point, to use your word, only because uh, it isn't going to change the fundamental issues of gun ownership. And whatever, wherever you stand on that... If you're if you're if you really want to restrict guns, and I think there's a, a lot, I'm I'm on the side of you know making gun owners be as responsible. You know, it's as hard to own a gun as it is to get a driver's license. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, that's my personal political opinion. I know that lots of people think otherwise. But no matter where you stand on this, this isn't going to really change that. This is not going to create a wave of people printing guns in their basement because it just doesn't. It's not. It's it's more for hobbyists. Uh, and by the way, one of the reasons that these, you know, really scary guns uh, like the AR-15 are popular is because they essentially are build-it-yourself guns. Uh, you get parts and pieces. In fact, the ATF is really challenged by these because what part is the gun? What part isn't? You can buy, you know, bump stocks aren't, that's not the gun. You can buy those. Uh, that may change sometime. It, it, it's a very complicated question. The 3D printing is not going to change that much at all. As always, uh, your answers are detailed and rational. Uh, have a safe and fun vacation, Leo. We'll miss you. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the question. It's a great question, Lewis. Uh, because, of course, as with any... And this is... this As a technology fan, as an enthusiast, as a, dare I say, a technologist myself, 
uh, it bothers me because you'll see the press, the media pick up these stories. And the only thing that makes this scary is the technology angle. It's not really any different than the situation we're already in. You're not going to see mass production of 3D guns. You can, by the way, if you want, you can go. You can go now to uh, to to Cody's site and download uh, the site. I'll tell you is Defense Distributed, D F D E F D I S T dot org, and um, you can download a a blueprint for printing a gun. Good luck making it. And by the way, uh, good luck if you want to fire it. <laughs> Because it's made out of plastic. And you better do this. You better know what you're doing. Because this thing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, in a million years try to fire this gun. <laughs> the, they call it the Liberator. It's an entirely plastic 3D printed gun. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what kind of 3D printer you'd need. But I'm thinking it's not PLA. I'm, I'm thinking you need something a little more. A little tougher to uh, to make this, and you still need uh, it, in order. It, this is, by the way, why he's it's not against the law. You you, you do need uh, a metal piece. So I guess it's the magazine, and the magazine size on this, by the way, one bullet. So um, it's 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 not exactly. By the way, you the, <laughs> the firing it is not even very easy it's more a curiosity it is i don't i think not as much of an issue if you if you're worried about guns as the as the very the absolute truth that it's easy to buy a gun at a gun show it's easy to steal a gun it's easy i mean the if you people the criminals who want guns can get guns they're not going to 3d print them it's really the 3d printing of guns is more a curiosity maybe for hobbyists things like that the uh, the ghost gunner, which is uh, is something Cody has on his website, is a CNC mill. It's a mill that carves objects out of wood or metal blocks. Um, it it is very expensive. I think it's thirty five hundred bucks, something like that. It's 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 more curiosity. It's a hobbyist thing. You, you need not you need not worry about three D printed guns any more than you worry about three D printed automobiles. Okay. Oh, I think those would be more dangerous, to be honest with you. <laughs> There's a greater risk to the public health uh, if somebody 3D prints an automobile. Fortunately, I don't think anybody's doing that yet. Um, 8888 Ask Leo. I, you know, this is where politics and uh, tech converge, and it's always an unholy alliance, and I, I kind of don't like to, you know, bring politics into the show. But uh I think it's important, if you're a technologist, it's important to talk rationally about the technology issues. I'm not defending necessarily the technology, but I am saying this isn't, it's not going to be an issue, public safety issue at all. 8888 Leo. we can uh, talk about it. That's what the phone number's for. Uh, hey, I'm right here. And Kim seems to want to challenge me, so... <laughs> Here's your chance to get through with a tough question. We also have a website, techguylabs.com, techguylabs.com. That's free. There's no sign-up. And it's another good place you can say how you feel because uh, every uh, every page on that site is a show. Every show is divided into hour, every hour into calls, and there's a comment section. There's no sign-up to use the site to read it. If you want to leave a comment, we ask you to log in with your Twitter or Facebook or Google. or it's just And that's purely to keep spam off the site. I'm not keeping track of that. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. More calls right after this. Hey, the Tech Guy podcast brought to you and my website, too, by WordPress.com. Oh, I love WordPress. Now, if you're a business or an individual and you don't have a website, get one. You need to own your home on the net. You That's... That's the first thing people will find when they search for your name. You want it to be something you control, right? Put your best stuff up there. And if you're a business and you don't have a website, it's like not having a yellow pages listing. People need the website to find out what your hours are, what you charge, what you do, examples of your work, that kind of thing. Uh, LeoLaporte.com, it's a WordPress.com. Steve Gibson's blog, WordPress.com. And this guy knows how to run a web server himself, but he it's easier. Let WordPress 
host it for you, keep it secure, keep it up to date. You don't need to know anything technical. They have great designs, great technology you can use. It's completely hassle-free. WordPress takes care of the hosting, the security, the software updates. You focus on what you do best, your content. You can upload images, video, audio, and more. You can import and export content to and, by the way, from your WordPress website. You're never trapped because it's your site, your home, your content. Grow your audience. Reach new customers. Built-in social uh, linking, which means your customers, your readers, can share your site to their Facebook, their Twitter. It's got search engine optimization, so your site ranks higher. Marketing tools, too. With the WordPress app, you can manage your site on the go. I run it on my iPhone and my Android device. And you'll know anytime you need help, you can get it from their 24-7 support team. When you need it, whenever. Plans start at just $4 a month. It's really no surprise. 31% of all the websites in the world run on WordPress. Right now, get 15% off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash techguy. We, uh, we love WordPress. I love WordPress. I've been using it since it came out. And I highly encourage you, if you're going to start a site, to go to wordpress.com slash techguy. Save 15%. You can thank me later. You belong on the web. You belong at wordpress.com slash techguy. We thank them for their support, making the Tech Guy podcast possible. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo, the phone number. You know, I, I actually, I'm going to say one more thing. We were talking about uh, this controversy over 3D printed guns. One thing that really bothers me is that nowadays on the web, and yes, even on TV news, have you ever heard the phrase link bait? The goal of, it seems, and this is a shame, uh, every blogger, every tech journalist, every 24-hour news channel host is to grab you. It's the equivalent of, and they used to do this in local news, remember? Uh, film at 11, you know, <laughs> man bites dog, film at 11. It's the tease. Only we've weaponized this into something called link bait. And, 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 and it's one of the things that's really ruined the discourse because these headlines now are so terrifying. Gizmodo had a headline, why 3D printed guns are getting more and more deadly and more and more terrifying. And, you know, you read the article and it's not that deadly or terrifying, but they got you to read the article. That's called link bait. And I think to some degree this kind of, this kind of routine sensationalism of the news in order to drive traffic has gotten out of hand. It's always been a problem, but I think it's really gotten out of hand. And it has not helped the discourse in this country. It has not helped us talk rationally about what's going on. We're, and I blame, and I'm in the media, I blame us, I blame us, I blame the media for this because uh, we need to stop doing that. We need to stop looking for clicks and, and views and hits and start trying to, you know, talk sensibly, rationally. I try to avoid, I hope I avoid link bait on this show. You know, but, uh, if, if you catch me doing it, yell at me. Line three, Eric, Orange County, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, how are you, Eric? I'm doing fine. Welcome. Yes, I have a question regarding my uh, satellite TV network. I just uh, cut the cord, and uh, my DVR, I had several movies recorded in it, uh, but I can't access them, and I'm hoping you can help me to do that. <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, you know, in the early days of DVRs, the earliest TiVos, in fact, I even wrote a book on this, uh, but it was a Series 1 TiVo. Uh, the, you know, you were recording on a TiVo, you were storing it on a hard drive as bits, and you could pull it off fairly easily. But that didn't last very long. The motion picture company, the TV companies, they all said, wait a minute, TiVo, <laughs> you can't allow people to do that. They'll pirate our content. So it didn't take long. I think it was the Series 2, maybe the Series 3. They started encrypting it. But then customers said, wait a minute. I want to watch my show. And they created something called TiVo to Go, which was a very poor DRM encumbered. DRM is copy protection, digital rights management, encumbered solution. And this is the problem is, is that the, the movie industry is so afraid of piracy that they're really not going to let you make direct copies you have it on the hard drive but it's, it's stored on the hard drive in such a way that you can't really use it 
Uh, is your DVR from the cable company? Oh, uh, yeah, a satellite company. Yeah, DirecTV or... Uh, uh, Dish. Dish, okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with the format that Dish uses on the DVR. I'm sure somebody in the chat room is. Is there any uh, chat room, is there any, like, TiVo to go style... A way of watching uh, stuff that's on his Dish DVR. I remember, Di I seem to remember that Dish, in fact, was much more lenient with this than others. In general, what we tell people uh, is to use the analog hole. This is something that the companies really try to, but can't do much about, because in order to watch your DVR, you have to have a way of, of getting the video out into the TV, right? So they, yeah. sometimes they call this the analog hole. If you if you can play it back, you can try to play it back into a recorder of some kind. Now, usually you can't do that over HDMI. That has high, something called HDCP. The CP stands for copy protection. They will prevent you from copying it. But you can usually use the analog uh, jacks, the component jacks, the red, white, and yellow jacks, to record to anything. There's no copy protection on them. Now, admittedly, that's lower quality. And I think it's one of the reasons that the movie companies haven't pursued this is, well, if he really wants a composite version of this, okay. Sometimes you can use the components, the red, green, and blue component jacks. Your DVR will have those for sure. Uh, those are also analog, but but they have there are copy protection schemes that, that sometimes are used on those. So take a look. Uh, so what you need to buy is something that can take the component output, the red, green, and blue output, or the composite output, most devices will do both, and turn it into bits that you can put on your, on your computer. And that means going out and buying something from a company like Hopog, <laughs> the worst named company in the world. It's named after a city in Long Island, H-A-U-P-P-A-U-G-E. Why you would name a company? Might as well be, you know, I mean, that's crazy. But anyway, Hopog makes a bunch of devices that will do this. Uh, or you could just search uh, for uh, analog to digital video converters, because that's what it is. And then you can record it to your hard drive or import it uh, you know, in. I don't know if a Dish has a way to do this, but they may. And that's another thing to search for is Dish, you know, analog to video. Now, here we go usdish.com transfer your DVR shows to a mobile it's not probably what you want exactly but at least it'll give you an idea of what you can uh, do um, that that really comes from the fact that the movie companies are very nervous about all this do you have a hopper is that what you have the dish hopper uh, no no okay so this was this is specifically for the hopper uh, it has a transfer command that will let you transfer the videos. Um, that's I remember. I remember this, and I thought, "Wow, how did they get away with that?" Oops! Dish has killed the access to the recorded shows once you kill the subscription. <laughs> oh, that's nice. So that's part of the copy protection. If you're not paying for Dish, the transfer may stop working. Well, that's what I was told after I had uh, disconnected the service. Yeah. I uh, called him up and said, hey, I would like to access. No, you can't. Sorry. So I would look then at the analog hole. See, it, what's on the back of your DISH device, I bet you there's red, green, and blue cables. Those are component cables. I, I know the HDMI will not work because it's copy protected, but the red, green, and blue well, might. I have, the, uh, I have the white, yellow, and red. Those will for sure work. They're lower quality, I understand. That's not going to be high def. But it depends what you recorded. It might be adequate for what you want. That for sure, you can always use those because you can play that onto a TV or VCR or anything, right? They're not protected. But that's but getting it out of the HDMI part, no, nope, you're out of luck as far as I know. Uh, AT and T, uh, which bought uh, AT and T bought Dish, right? I think they did. Yeah, you, you're not going to expect them to be uh, amenable. <laughs> oh, sure, no problem. No problem. <laughs> that all sounds like a whole lot more work than I'm willing to do. I know. Do I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. If, if you can play the recordings, then then you are then you can get it out. Actually, now somebody's reminding me, oh, wait a minute. Maybe he can't even, the DVR may not even play anymore because you don't have the subscription. 
if that's the case, oh, AT&T bought DirecTV, that's right. If that's the case, uh, yeah, you're really out of luck. You can't just take the hard drive out of there and copy the files because they're specially encoded, encrypted, scrambled. Mike B says you might try if you have a FireWire connector on the back. Sometimes those are live. Usually those are not alive, but if there is a FireWire connector on the back, you... <laughs> you might be able to get it off of there, but that, of course, means you now need to get a FireWire, because nothing supports FireWire anymore. You need to get a FireWire adapter. <laughs> oh, my, my, my. They really, they just don't want you to. Buy the DVD. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. And all that jazz, 8888, ask Leo the phone number, 888-827-5536. And a little later on in the show, I'm going to tell you how to get an Apple Macintosh computer, one of the new 2018 machines, absolutely free. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not gonna do that. There, there, there's no way to do that. Uh, that would be link bait, as we were talking about last hour. That would be a good example of, of link bait. You see that stuff, though, don't you, all the time? It's just, uh, oh, it's disheartening. 8888 Ask Leo, partly because I'm trying, you know, we try to make good content uh, without uh, overhyping it and sensationalizing it. And it's hard to compete against uh, somebody offering free Macintosh computers, right? <laughs> Even if they didn't exist. 8888275536. Ron in Canoga Park, California is next. Hello, Ron. Hi, Leo. Uh, I am about to charge out my new, change out my new, uh, my old cell phone because it's running out of battery. It's uh, a Motorola Z and uh, first edition, and uh, it's just old and uh, it's not keeping a charge. And, and it's I one of those that you another... can't, you can't swap out the battery, I guess, huh? No, no. You no, might, you might I visit wherever you bought it and see if they offer a battery upgrade plan. Because if you like the phone. Uh... The battery's the only issue. You probably can get the battery upgraded. Well, there's one more issue, and that's the fact that I'm a klutz. <laughs> and and when I went to to Verizon, uh, I guess there's the there was two versions of this. One was the one I got, and the other one was the one with Gorilla Glass and all uh -oh. the other. Yeah. I wasn't really given the option, and, yeah. and for some reason they didn't realize that I was a dangerous person. <laughs> and so I, I wound up uh, buying the one that cracked all the time. And uh, oh, I'm, sorry. Uh, I'm tired of having to look around the cracks to see what my screen It's time for a new phone, absolutely. It's time for yeah. a new phone, yeah. yes, sir. And I, on the other hand, don't want to go flagship because you know, I, I'm, I do not play games and uh, I'm not a uh, elite photographer like you. And, uh, <laughs> not an elite by any means, but uh, yeah, if you yeah, so you can get another Moto Z. They uh, they've updated those. They're up to the Z two or Z squared now, and they do make that Force edition that is they say guaranteed shatterproof. Although my experience is glass is glass. You can make it gorilla or not. It maybe is a little tougher, but glass mm -hmm. if if struck pro in the proper fashion will crack no matter what. Mm -hmm. They say guaranteed shatterproof display. Uh, it is an aluminum unibody. Those are pretty tough. And uh, the new Moto Zs, uh, I don't know if yours did, support these Moto Mods. I don't know how great that is or not, but these are little snap-on yeah, things you can I, put I, on the I back. I get involved with the mods. The other one I was looking at, actually, I, for some reason, I've always bought uh, Motos. They're great. Um, I'm nothing wrong with the Motos. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not addicted to them, but, but the idea was it always seemed the one that made sense for me. Uh, but I'm looking at the G6. That's my... F if, if you were to say, I want a budget Android device... Yeah. Uh, that that is all, as close to non compromise as you can get. The G family is it. Uh, mm -hmm. They're half the price of the flagship phones. They're you know they tend to be between two and four hundred dollars. They're they're not uh, the greatest cameras, but they're pretty darn good. They're not mm -hmm. the greatest screens, but they're pretty darn good. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the people who have Moto Gs are big big fans. So mm -hmm. I would not hesitate to say, you know, if you can go to the Verizon store and say, hey, I'm due for an upgrade, what are you going to do for me with a Moto G? Well, I would... The other thing is that uh, T-Mobile has got a, a senior plan 
uh, we're looking to switch to. So That's a good uh, plan. Maybe. I know, and I like that plan. I can't use it because uh, I can't remember. I have too many phones, I think. But <laughs> but the, the senior plan, if you're 55 uh, or older, you can get two lines for $70 a month, and that's unlimited uh, talk, text, and data. Mm -hmm. That's a very good deal. And, and of course, T-Mobile has all the same phones. In fact, they have, in my opinion, a little bit better phones than uh, Verizon. Verizon, at least until recently, liked to customize their phones. You know, they did the droids. The mm -hmm. you know Those are Motorola phones, but they were specially made for Verizon. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a big fan, frankly, of the droids. So uh, mm -hmm. you'll get more standard uh, phones. And, and because you're walking in the door, they should give you a pretty good deal. On uh, on a Moto G, I would think uh, to get you as a customer. So you're you're kind of in the catbird seat. Okay. Well, this really, I for some reason have been, you know, going around looking at different stuff and different phones, and this helps me pick it out uh, a little bit better. I appreciate. Looks like it. the uh, uh, let's see the Moto. Well, I don't, I'm looking at their prices. I don't see the Moto. G6, but uh, they have the LG G6. The Moto, I think, is the G5 currently. But mm -hmm. but you go in there and see what they have. And the nice thing is, if you if you have a T-Mobile store nearby, they'll have most of those phones in stock. You could play with the Note Nine and or, or the Note Eight and the Note and the S Nine and pretend you're interested, and then say, "Well, what can you do for me?" and and see what they could do for you. What about the option of buying it unlocked off Amazon or something? I kind of like doing that. That's me because I move around. Um, the that's always an option. T-Mobile is pretty good about unlocking the phone once you've paid it off. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if you price shop, they're the same phone, okay. basically. Carrier okay. locking is, uh, for the most part, only used to kind of keep you locked into the carrier until the phone is paid off. And then mm -hmm. in most cases, you just call the carrier and say, look, I'm paid in full. I'm, gonna, I'm a customer in good standing and I'm going to travel. I need you to unlock this phone. And they usually will do that. Great. Well, thanks for all your help, Leo. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. Walmart has the G6 uh, I unlocked, I presume. Maybe not for $127. That's a great price. That is a great You're phone. Kidding. Yeah. That is a I great mean, phone. Yeah. That's that's where you, you might... Yeah, they'll probably sign you up to T-Mobile, but that's fine. Okay. We're in. Take it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. That senior plan is great. I, uh, I'm old enough to take advantage of it, but I want more than two lines. I call them asked. They said, no, you have too many lines, Leo. you, you got to keep paying. Okay. Just asking. You're old enough, Leo. Don't worry about that. You just, uh, you got too many lines. I have Sims for, uh, the reason I, I have so many lines is that I want to be able to review phones. I buy my phones to review. I don't generally take review units. And I want to be able to, I don't think it's fair to, to say, here's what I think of a phone after you used it for a week or two. I think you got to. I think you got to go all in on it, which makes my life hard because every time I, you know, like the Note Nine comes out, I have to then move everything over and use it, like it's my phone because it is. But uh, I use a Google Voice, which allows me to have one number and ring five phones, so I pretty much always have five phones in play at any given time. Right now, though, the phones you'll see in my pocket are the uh, iPhone 10, and I have to have an Android phone, and my current pick for Android, of course, is the Google version of Android, because it's the most up-to-date. In fact, I'm now using Android 9 Pi, which just came out this week. By the way, very nice if you can upgrade to it. And there are some other phones that you can upgrade to it, like the, uh, I think, the Essential phone, the OnePlus phone, but I'm using a Google Pixel 2 XL, and that has an excellent camera. There's flaws in the phone in other ways, but uh, it's boy, the camera is good on that. So that's uh, those are two. That's my what they call the daily driver, the Google Pixel 2 XL and the iPhone 10. But that's about to change, isn't it? Don't know when the Apple event will be, but it'll probably be almost certainly be in one month. Now, the normal time Apple would do it, Apple doesn't want to do it the day after Labor Day. Labor Day is a Monday, and they don't want to do it on a Tuesday after Labor Day because they don't want their employees to have to work. Because when you're doing an event, yeah, everybody works for, you know, solid for the week before that. They don't want them to work during Labor Day. So, But the problem is the Tuesday after the Tuesday after Labor Day is 9-11. I don't know how Apple feels about doing an event on 9-11. So maybe I'm thinking 9-18, September 18th for the Apple event. They'll announce new iPhones. We shall see. Leo Laporte, 
the Tech Guy 8888 Ask Leo. It's kind of a leisurely, nice Sunday, isn't it? We're taking it easy, sitting around the Cracker Barrel. We'll talk more tech right after this. The Tech Guy 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number, Chris Markwater, photo guy coming up in just a little bit. But uh, meanwhile, let's get back to the calls and Don in San Pedro, California. Hello, Don. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? All pretty good. Uh, I got to ask you something about we're going on a cruise to Alaska and um, just trying to figure out you know, how to do Wi-Fi because those Wi-Fi plans are expensive as heck. Yeah, and I don't recommend them, but you may not have much choice, which, which I love, by the way. The cruises to Alaska are beautiful. We went on a Holland America cruise. I took my dad uh, a few <laughs> years ago. It was a chess cruise, so there were all these chess masters. It was so much fun. Who's who's cruise line? Oh. Princess? No, we're going. Believe it or not, on Carnival. Nice. That's all right. They own everybody else. Why not? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's going from Long Beach to all the way up and back. Nice. Yeah. So the reason I ask is different cruise lines have different uh, Wi-Fi capabilities. Um, right. The, I've never been on a ship with decent internet when it's at sea because. The, when they're at sea, they use a satellite. They use usually Inmarsat to get the the Wi-Fi, the internet, and it's slow by itself. And then you're yeah. sharing it with however many other people are using the internet on the boat, which could be hundreds, maybe thousands. So you can imagine how slow it gets in the middle of the day. The only exception yeah. to that was uh, the Royal Caribbean lines. They um, they kind of have to. I was on the Anthem of the Seas, which is basically a floating apartment building. Fifty five hundred people on that boat. And I don't know how they did it. They call it Voom. But the Wi-Fi on there was very fast. It was almost as fast as home. It was certainly usable. And it was priced even more expensive than the Carnival. So um, it, so I, unless Carnival's upgraded the Wi-Fi in the boat, which boat are you on? Um, I can't remember. I okay. think inspiration. Unless they've upgraded the Wi-Fi. You know, I, don't, I imagine at some point everybody... We'll be doing what RCI is doing, um, but until they do, let's see. The inspiration, yeah, it's a little bit. Of, it's a little bit of an older ship, uh, three thousand four hundred fifty passengers, and probably they're using that Inmarsat Wi-Fi, which means it's going to be basically unusable. The only solution I've found is to get up in the middle of the night when nobody, everybody's asleep, maybe four a.m. Before, yeah. the, before the early risers get up and then download all the email. Then you can work on all, on the email all day and then you can upload it the next night. It is it, That's how bad it is. It is really, yeah, oh, wow. really slow. Now, once you're in port, you're okay. And since you're yeah. going to be in the U.S., your phone plan will be the same and you'll be able to do everything you can do with your phone. Okay. Well, I was kind of hoping for a fix. Also, I wanted to make one mention. Yeah. Um, how crazy technology is. I called your show, um, and on my cell phone, I went to a coffee bean. And, uh, I won't say the rest, but uh, I went to a coffee shop, paid with my phone while I was on hold with you. What? And 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 did an NFC um, swipe right with my phone right all at the same time. So this is I why this is why the smartphone is in a is a unique category in technology, and why. For instance, uh, the government wants to get into it, and, and tech companies are trying to prevent the government. You do everything on this phone. This phone yeah. is now more than any teenager's diary. This phone knows where you are, what you bought, what you did, everything. It's all in there, and it's, I mean, and it's, it's, a, it's remarkable. What a convenient, it's your wallet, it's everything. Yeah. It's so convenient. And I think that's only going to get more serious. I notice I'm using tap to pay a lot more than I used to. It's, oh, yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah. And I have a Samsung, so I get the bonus points when oh, I nice. use it. And the so, Samsung's neat because Samsung Pay works with the old card swipe readers as well as the yeah. touch to pay. So you can use that everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it freaks out people when they, they say, no, no, Apple Pay doesn't work here. I said, it's not an Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that same experience. It was so funny. And, and and one guy said, well, I've heard about this. Let me see. <laughs> Let me watch it work. And you just hold it next to the swipe card reader, the MagStripe card reader. And I guess it's putting out the same signal. And the card reader goes, oh, yeah, sure. I see your visa. That's amazing. It's amazing stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Leo. Hey, Appreciate my pleasure. You. Enjoy your cruise. You know what? Tell everybody I'm offline. Have a really good week. With <laughs> You're actually going to be happy. Uh, I probably will be. Yeah, I know it's hard. You're going to go the first day. You might be shaking a little bit. <laughs> probably. But you're going to love it. I uh, What we do is we set up the, you know, your most email providers will let you do a vacation responder. So yeah. I set up a vacation responder that says, hey, I am I am in Alaska. I can't, I, I can't read your email, so I'll be back on August 29th. You know, send, send it yeah. then, because I can't. Oh, hey, a, a quick follow-up question. Sure. Um, do you think I should bring my Roku to, for the TV? No. <laughs> Same reason. No. Yeah, but, uh, but I'm saying if I transfer phone videos to my phone. Oh, as long as you can, yeah, play from your phone to your Roku. Yeah. Yeah. But don't expect Netflix to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, no, that's not a bad idea. Or a, not even a Roku. Just get a Chromecast. They're 35 bucks. You plug it into the back of the TV. The issue is they that either a Roku or the Chromecast both have to be on the ship's Wi-Fi, and your phone has to be on the ship's Wi-Fi. That's a little tricky. Can you, on your uh, phones, send directly to the Roku? Uh, yeah, I can. I can, I can uh, mirror cast okay. my phone directly to the so Roku. So that would work because you won't have okay. to be on the Wi-Fi for that. You yeah. Miracast right I think that uh unless Miracast see that's the problem. I think you might still need the Wi Fi because I think Miracast still is gonna go through the Wi Fi to get onto the uh, Roku. It's not like it's magically sending the signal. <laughs> I guess that's an interesting question. If you turned on the hotspot on the phone and used Miracast, had the had the Roku join your hotspot, you wouldn't have any internet access, but now you're on the same network. Maybe that would work. Try it before you leave. Yeah, I'm going to play with it. Thanks, Leo. All right, take care. Yeah, cable would be the easier way to do that. Get a USB to go cable, which uh, works with that Samsung phone, and you can just play it straight out. Anybody try that? I think you'd have to put your phone in hotspot mode, have the Roku be set up to work with the hotspot on the phone, and, you know, both are saying, well, I got no internet. I got no internet here, but that's okay. I just want to send this video to the Roku. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, Dobby, that is the uh, Anthem of the Seas and the other uh, Anthem-class boats on uh, RCI have red cameras. I actually went up to the uh, the bridge, and uh, they have these red cameras in the corners of the bridge taking pictures of the ocean. And they also have reds on the side of the ship because some of the... the it's actually quite clever. Some of the rooms are inside rooms. They don't have windows. They don't have portholes. So what they do in there is they install a sideways large screen high def screen and they play the red camera video from the side of the boat so it lo you looks like you have a window and unless you really look closely psychologically it totally feels like that tiny cabin that tiny inside cabin is has the biggest window of all it looks great it's pretty funny no the, they have to be red zbd zbdoo hello there chris mcquart Hello, how are you? I'm well, how are you? I am just fine. Let's brighten you up. I'm brighten me. Brighten I'm, you send, I'm sending you a decent picture. Oh, you're doing a great job. It's not you. Oh, it's the dim TV. It's the TV set. <laughs> now you have a blue bar. There, look how good Chris looks. Look at that. I think, I think we should keep that blue bar. <laughs> <laughs> anonymous. Chris is anonymous. Yes. I uh, I will take on our cruise. We're leaving on a cruise September first. I will take my Mac laptop, my iPad. Oh, speaking of Mac laptop, yeah. I got the uh, MacBook you, Pro now. Hey, what do you think? Yeah, it's good, isn't it? I like it. Lightroom's actually it usable. Oh, it's perfectly usable. I'm. I don't even mind the touch bar. The only thing I really hate is that I have to re retrain myself to use uh, caps lock for the escape key now. Oh, that's a good idea. You reassigned. I'm a caps VI lock. user, you know. I edit in yeah. VI. <laughs> See, that's the problem. Is I actually, yeah, with VI, you'd really have a problem. I make no, caps no, lock I'm... my control key for Emacs, you, uh... and that, you don't use escape quite as much. But you're right. For VI, you'd really want the. Oh, you a need an escape, escape key, key, and it yeah. just needs to be physical. So, I've all, I've mapped all my Macs 
to caps lock being the escape key yeah. now and I'm I'm retraining my muscle memory to not put the left pinky all the way up but just to the side get a um <clears throat> get a program called better touch tool that, I heard of that. That lets that really makes the touch bar much more useful. And then you know you can use Automator to write scripts that you could put on the touch bar. So yeah. even if a program doesn't support the touch bar, and most don't, uh, you can actually have actions for that program on the touch bar. Mm. Well, at this point, I mean, I'm using the touch bar mainly to like brighten the screen or yeah. change the volume, that yeah. kind of stuff. <clears throat> and that's pretty. Pretty better cool touch for tool. That. Get better touch tool. You'll you'll find okay. many uses for it. Yeah, but on the other hand, I'm I'm a touch typist. I'd never look at the keyboard. Well, that's me. the problem. So, it makes you look. So at the I, keyboard. I don't really I don't really interact with the touch right. that much. What I put the time, uh, the battery life, you know, how many hours I've got left and stuff like that on the touch bar. I make oh, it cool. informational like a, as opposed to functional. Little I start menus type yeah. thing on there. Yeah, you could basically do that. Yeah, CPU. That sounds cool. All of that stuff. Anything you can script, uh, you can put there. So that's that's a really good way to do it. Um, what do you want to talk about? Sounds in cameras. Sounds. Sounds. All right. Camera sounds. Okay. It's a bit. It's kind of a bit, a bit a bit philosophical, but in a good way. Okay. What what Leica do you have? Which one is that? Which Leica camera? I have a. I have two Leica cameras, the Leica Q and the Leica um, uh, an M3, an old ma uh, film M3. M3, okay. Yeah. But the um, that's good. The lens I'm bringing <clears throat> is this is the Leica mm. Favor is the um, Summicron Ace A spherical. The yeah. F mm -hmm. F 2.0 A spherical, widely considered. The best lens ever made. By the way, I can hear the music. Oh, that. <laughs> I'd rather talk to you about my camera. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time to talk digital photography with our photo guru, Mr. Chris Markward of DiscoverTheTopFloor.com. Hello, Chris. Hello, Leo. Oh, How are you today? Oh, boy, it's camera time. I love talking about cameras. <laughs> I would talk I'm about not, photography, but I'm a terrible photographer, so I prefer to talk about cameras. No, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. Um, I want to talk a bit. Of, uh, well, it's it's kind of a mixture between tech and not really tech. More okay. Well, listen, listen to this. Listen to this. Okay. Yeah. That's the sound of a camera. That right? sounds good. Yeah. It's a, it's a digital SLR, and it does that clicky sound. Listen, listen to this one. Wow, that's even more clicky, and I like the little. Zzzz. Are you winding film in that one? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a Mamiya six forty five. That's an old. That's like a Hasselblad. That's a an old uh, medium format camera. You want to hear my camera? Cameras? That's a nice now, sound, isn't it? There's a bit of a difference. That's here. a mirrorless, though. What 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 makes that sound? Well, that's um, the big question. Normally, it's the mirror moving out of the way. I don't know what it, what does make that sound. Well, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's a digital component to that sound. You think it's a recording? Well, part of it. Digital if, component. If, it's a recording. If you press the shutter button on an iPhone, the iPhone camera sound is a is a Canon AE1. You're it's kidding. An old Canon AE1. They record. No, let is. me try that. Wait a minute. Let me try that. They recorded that's a Canon AE1 to old mechanical camera. <gasps> yep. That's a good sound. And an ape. So the interesting <laughs> thing is, my, first of all, why do we have these sounds? And the second yeah. question I want to talk about today is, why do, do, well, do we actually need them? What are they there for? Now, of course, I mean, we, when we look at the traditional camera has a shutter and that shutter is either a leaf shutter um, where you have just a tiny little thing in the lens that opens up and closes again. And those are usually very very delicate in sound, very soft in sound. And then you have what we call a focal plane shutter, where, where you have, the, like in a DSLR, you have this, this whole curtain in front of the sensor, and when you press a shutter button, a mirror swings up, and the curtain opens, and a curtain closes, you the mirror swings you, back down. You don't need to record and sounds that's, for that. That's, that's noisy. That is this sound, right? That's, yeah. that's yeah. like 10 different things happening almost at the same time. And... Uh, but even in a mirrorless camera like this Sony A7R, 
there's a something. There's a shutter. Something's doing something, right? Most of those cameras do have a shutter. Your camera has a shutter. It's yeah. a focal plane shutter. That's, it's not moving mirror, but it is certainly doing uh, some mechanical motion. So you know what I like though about these there? cameras, they do have a silent mode. And that's the that's the interesting thing because with the uh, digital cameras, especially the mirrorless ones, we are more and more getting to cameras that are really good with 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 silent shutters where yeah. nothing moves mechanically anymore where the sensor just takes the picture and there are some jurisdictions where that's not allowed because yeah, people there don't know some, well be, yes because people don't know so so in some jurisdictions the camera has to make a sound or really could be in trouble yes def definitely um wow and for certain genres, what if you just go if you make the sound. <laughs> if I make the sound, would that satisfy? If it's, if it's convincing. <laughs> um, for for some kind of photography, you might not want a sound when you try to do stealth right. photography in right. the street, for example. Street right. photography and you come with a big, loud, clunky, medium format That's camera. That's why I use these Sony cameras. I can sneak up on people. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say that yeah. out loud. But then there is another aspect and uh, I find this most interesting and it's when you work with people. If you do a portrait session with someone, uh, the sound of the camera is a pretty important aspect. I agree. Because you, I agree. You, you take a photo and let's first look at the kind of sound. Again, again, this one, it's a pretty, it's a pretty harsh sound. It's a pretty aggressive sound. So if you take photos of a person that is very, well, shy, you might scare them. You might, <laughs> they, they might not be themselves in front of the camera because of that loud kalunk. Um, On the other I, hand, there's people like me. I want to know when you're taking the picture so I can pose and then that reset. Is, that is the other aspect. Um, for, for, for first, try to look at the, at, the, at the kind of person. And if you have the choice of cameras and it's a very shy person, maybe a camera with a, a leaf shutter, maybe yeah. a Leica, very delicate, very fine sounds uh, are the better choice. I maybe, remember maybe mirrorless uh, works for those. I had a good friend who's a photography uh, buff, Eric Fingal, who used a Leica to take pictures at chess tournaments. He and I were chess buffs, and he would oh. always take his Leica because it made a click, but it was a very, very subdued click because you don't want to make big areas, noises at chess tournaments. That's true. That's true. Or yeah. weddings, or weddings for that matter. Yeah. Um, or at a Hollywood movie set. Oh there, God, that would you'd be in trouble. Well, there used to be uh, there used to be companies who made so-called camera blimps. A camera blimp <laughs> is an enclosure. It's not, it's not, it doesn't make your camera fly, but it's an enclosure. <laughs> I want a camera blimp. <laughs> it's an it's an it's a soundproofing camera enclosure. Oh, so you can take pictures. That, that you pretty much you preset the camera and then yeah. you can can access some of the buttons from the outside and there's a, a pane of glass in the front that you shoot through, and you end up having a silent camera on set. The, the last manufacturer um, in Los Angeles uh, just went out of business because no one's buying those anymore because because those set photographers now use silent cameras. They use mirrorless. They use mirrorless this cameras. Is, I just turned silent shooting on on my Sony A7R yeah. II. You want to hear it? Well. <laughs> Can you hear it? Nope. There, I'm taking pictures. Just took 100 pictures. It's silent. Yeah, there we go. Now, is it lower but, quality? Um, well, it, it's technically it's a bit different because it's you, not using uh, that physical shutter anymore. It's using a digital. In shutter. some light conditions, you might actually be uh, better off with a mechanical shutter. Yeah. But uh, that depends on the kind of a CMOS or a CCD, and if it does global shutter, and that's a very technical thing. But one aspect that you just mentioned is this kind of the tension and relief aspect of a portrait session. Right. You take a picture, and it goes click, and the person in front of the camera knows, oh, now I can let Relax. my guard down. Yeah. And that's when I take a second shot, <laughs> because because then you get that portrait of a person oh, who's who's sneak. themselves, who's relaxed, who's who's. So uh, you want a noisy well, camera because you want them to think you've taken the picture. Well, and relax. You, you, you take a picture and then you just uh, wait for half a second, and they will will let their guard down, and then you take that next picture. And that's what you need a shutter sound for. That's uh. where the shutter sound is. Really, really important. Actually, you know what you really need? You need a dual shutter, sh shutter sound. The first one's noisy, and the second one's silent. 
a little Arduino with a speaker in your shirt, <laughs> and then you simulate shutter sounds. So, do point and shoot cameras uh, when they make those big chunky click sounds? Those are probably recordings, aren't they? Those are digital. Those are recordings or artificial in some way. Um, there's wow. not much mechanics in those cameras. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that funny? So that nice chunk you're getting out of your point and shoot, that's probably just I mean, a, rec a, a recording. But then I get all nostalgic when I hear that one. It's funny. I didn't realize. So what is the, what is the uh, Apple camera shutter sound? A Canon AE-1 uh, SLR. It sounds really good. Of course, Apple would record a really good camera for the shutter sound. How funny! Yep. I wonder what, what that's Google, what they did. What does Google use I'm, I'm, on my on the Pixel? I don't 2. know. I don't know. Because <laughs> let me let me let me play it. You can, maybe that's you can great. identify it. I'll turn on my. I usually have the sound turned off during the show, but I'll turn on the sound for right now. Uh, here we go. This is the Google, the Google camera. Nothing. That it is like that is that is digital. It's a spit. <laughs> It's spitting. That hey, if you want to go on a photo expedition with Chris and learn and have fun, is Lafoten still open? Go to Discover uh, the we Top. We still have one spot open. One spot. One spot go open. to discoverthetopfloor.com right now. Discoverthetopfloor.com. Many workshops coming up in this uh, the rest of this year and uh, next year, too. Uh, and, of course, Chris's podcast, Tips from the Top Floor, is first rate. Chris Marquardt, great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. And I'll do the assignment when we get back. Yeah, that's very disappointing, Google. Google is not like Apple. Google's not going to try to fool you. That's just basically well, a token. Well, I mean, the, the, A, the AE1 in the iPhone doesn't fool me either because it's coming from a tiny speaker. This is it's not attempting to do anything. It's like... Pft, pft. Yeah, but I mean, this this is just... Ah. Oh, I know. It's just making me jealous. Ah. I you can you can actually feel it too, by the way. Oh, but the, and 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 there's where digital shutters come in handy because you don't get any mirror slap, you don't yeah, get any yeah. can shoot more stable. So there there's lots of pros and cons there. I remember the first A7 I had, people were complaining because of the mirror slap, or not mirror slap, or whatever the slap was, that was j jiggling the camera, and they really had a problem mm -hmm. with it. They've solved that. They've dampened it down, but. Uh, or, or they had cameras that had mirror lockup, where you locked the mirror up before right. you took the picture, so you took the, so the whole the, vibration I, out. I remember reading that the A9, my other Sony, um, if you shoot in silent mode, it does not degrade the image in any way. That they have some sort of digital curtain that that uh, is. Well, okay. <clears throat> so so the the way if you, if you have a minute, I can explain that to you. The the way this works is they they the the cameras, the 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 sensor. Um, counts well it collects photons makes them into a charge and that gets measured and that measurement happens line by line and the way it gets measured out is that it's pretty much like a like a bucket brigade you know the the all the pixels move one to the left and another one to the left and so on and at the end there is a counter that counts and measures pretty much it says we got a frame um, so we're done it takes it takes a while to do that right and uh this what <clears throat> what sony has with global shutter is they have pretty much a second shutter underneath the first one yeah. so uh a second sensor underneath the first one right so they stack what they do right. is they 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 drop all the charge from the buckets onto that second layer and then the first layer is ready again immediately oh, they do it that's all how the once. global shutter works ah. and then they can they can read that out in the background without disturbing the actual picture taking perfect that's how the um, a9 does it but it means, it means you pretty sensor. much have two layers of sensors right uh, they have to on, do a stack sensor thing. there's a lot yeah. of other benefits i think with a stacked sensor that a9 is amazing but it and this can't was be this was a really a simplification so no one yeah nobody no, but i get it now i get what you're saying <laughs> but the a9 uh does not have the megapixels of this this the a7r has 42 megapixels and i've I figured since I, it's not speed of focus that matters anymore. <laughs> that not I, really. Because I, I'm manually focusing, I should just take the A7R2 with my nice lens. I could use this nice lens on the A9, but I think that's wasted. I think the 7R2 is perfect. Yeah, so do I. It's, I, it's I think, lighter. Yeah, it does yeah. everything you need. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I hope Lisa's not hurt because she gave me the A9, and I love the A9. And, and it's but. a good travel package. This is really this, a nice little travel package. And yeah. I got the uh, I got the the leash version of the um uh whatchamacallit uh lens strap. So it's a thinner, a little bit thinner, lighter 
peak design. Is it an R strap? It's or? peak design. I have an R strap. I like the R strap, but the peak design does these quick release things. Oh, those ones, yeah, yeah. I really like That's these. That's pretty good stuff. And so I can put, and what I do, I can have it uh, the standard neck holster, or I can have a sling. So I have three of those little things, so I can move it depending on how I want to shoot today. And then this leash really is quick, re, has very quick resizing. So it's a nice little combination. I like Peak Design. This is a this is a perfect uh, strap for this. See, yeah, that's so all that I care about, straps, difference. lenses, things like that, because I can't take a decent picture. But I got the gear. Yeah. I got the gear. Uh, we gonna do the, uh, foot, for we're going to do the foot Mr. assignment Report. or the shoe assignment next week? Uh, shoe assignment. Yeah, I think we should do this next week right. because after that. We're gone. Be gone. Thank you, Chris. All right. All right. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Perfect song for Michael Cozy, our musical director. Hey, a reminder, we have one more week in our photo assignment for Chris Marquardt. Each, uh, each month he gives us an assignment uh, to take pictures. It's really just to encourage you to get out and take pictures. You can uh, pick your best one and upload it to our tech guy group on Flickr. Our assignment this month has been shoe, shoe, whatever that means to you, the word or concept shoe. S H O E. Put that in your uh, in your when you upload it to Flickr. Put that in your tags, so we know what it is, and submit it to the Tech Guy group. Our moderator Renee Silverman will welcome you and thank you. And uh, you can do up to one a week, so that means you could put one more. I put one up there. I got to put another shoe picture up there. I'm looking for the perfect shoe picture. So because uh, I yeah, you know, I'm not going to compete, but Chris will pick three shots to talk about next week on the Tech Guy Show. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number on the line, Jim from San Diego. Hello, Jim. Hi, Leo. Hey. My question is uh, about the Epson uh, Echo Tank printer. Our sponsor, how yes. Good, how good is its resolution? Uh, is it good enough for a photograph, photography prints, uh, smaller and up to 8.5 by 11? And the reason I ask, the spec on the, uh, the holes... Uh, is a little larger than some other specs I've seen. Yeah, I would. <clears throat> it is not intended to be a photo printer. Uh, okay, so that's, but that's not yeah. resolution so much. I think the resolution's adequate. It's uh, the type of printing. You know, a good photo printer. This is really more business color. Uh -huh. A good photo printer. Uh, you want it to have rich, deep uh, colors. You want it to look like you know you went to the one hour photo or better. Right. And printed it. And the Eco Tank does not do that. It's business color. Ah, uh, okay. Epson makes okay. excellent photo printers. In fact, every photographer I know uses Epson to print. But look for the ones that are say, that say Epson photo printers, and that'll give I you a see. choice. They're the only ones that I know of that can do decent uh, monochrome, black and white printing. That's a very hard, turns out, very hard thing for an inkjet to do. <clears throat> Epson figured it out. There's a, a problem, an issue called metamorism, and only Epson has figured that out. So Epson had the expressions... Uh, are there uh, photo printers? They used to make the artisans. I think that they've replaced those with the expressions. Take a look at those. Uh, in my opinion, you should have a separate printer for photo printing and then from your business printing, your your your, your black and white, your your text printing, because you because yeah, of course. The huge ink consumption is with the photo printing. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the serious photo uh, printers, the serious photographers, almost all use uh, well. I don't know if Epson offers eco tanks. I don't think they do, but I remember people using basically tank modifications on Epson printers in order to get, you know, exactly what you want, which is a lot of ink at a lower cost. That's the right. beauty of the eco tank. I bet you in the higher end professional printers they do offer tanks. I'm just looking to see um, the expression. No, I mean, maybe not. That's interesting. Remember also one of the things you'll see uh, with a photo printer that you don't see in the EcoTanks is more than four colors. The EcoTanks, it's CMYK printing. But usually in the photo printers, they'll have twice as many cartridges. They'll have a black, actually not quite twice as many. They'll have a black, but then they'll have a bright cyan and a, and a uh, I don't know what they call it, dark cyan. Bright magenta, dark magenta. Bra well, bright I haven't gone that color. far. <laughs> well, that's for the best. I mean, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, really professional. <clears throat> yeah. The larger format Epson photo printers do have tanks, uh, says Scooter X. So, uh, yeah, if you once you get, but that's now you're talking thousands of dollars for the printer. Right, right. That'd take a long time to recover that. Yeah, no. I would, you know, the app, Expression Photo, which is a very nice small all-in-one. They have, you know, two hundred twenty-nine dollars. 
Uh, and it, I'm pretty sure, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's a six cartridge or seven cartridge printer. Yeah. Yep. Okay, and I, I wanted to make a comment on your comments on uh, the gun issue. Yes, please. I think, you, I think you covered that generally very well, but I would correct you uh, on two points. It is just as easy to buy a gun from your local gun dealer as it is at a... Uh, a gun show. There's no. They have to meet the same. The gun shows have to meet the same laws, and everything required of a a gun dealer. Gun shows have to meet. Okay. So there's no there's no change there. I thought now maybe correct me. I thought a gun show did not have the same requirements to do the background checks. Oh no, they have to they do, do background okay. checks, and you have to wait to get the gun. Uh, the other Good to know. was you made a statement, and again, I agree with this basic statement, but not how you said it. Okay. You said uh, as difficult to obtain a gun as a driver's license. In neither case is the intent to make it difficult. In both cases, the intent is to make sure that you have the competence and safety. I agree 100%. To, uh, use it well. And, I, and wasn't, I didn't mean I to agree, focus on I the difficulty. I don't mean to focus on the difficulty, but it, but it should be a requ uh, uh, strict requirement. How about that? Right. I, yeah, and I agree with you. So long as the intent yes. is uh, safety, reasonable no, no. safety, reasonable we don't want, competence, no. I'm it shouldn't, absolute agreement It shouldn't with you. be difficult, but you should have to uh, know what you're doing. Action, exactly. <laughs> right? Uh, is right. it is it is it the case that to get a gun I need to have the same kind of is there a test is there uh, you know a, a firing range test are there written tests anything like that? Uh, that's required for a concealed carry permit. Uh, I'm not aware of actual uh, firing capability. Yeah. Uh, it is recommended that you take such. Absolutely, uh, I wouldn't buy a gun without and, taking that. I'd hurt myself. Yeah, and in California, we definitely are required to have a test on uh, about safety and such. It's Good. a written test. Excellent. But uh, I think yeah, that's fair. Definite rules. And I laws. think that's yeah. fair. I think I shouldn't Absolutely. shouldn't shouldn't be any less demanding to, to buy a gun than it is to drive a car. Both are deadly yeah. weapons. If, exactly. If misused. So. And, and by the way, the yeah. car is a far more deadly weapon. I agree. A lot more people get killed with that. A million a year worldwide. One million Absolutely. a year worldwide. Absolutely. Yep. And I don't know of any gun owner that, that wouldn't agree with both of us on this point, that, that what we're discussing right no. now. Yeah, and, and that's why I think it's overblown, this 3D gun thing. This is not a threat. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, nobody's going to do This is a hobbyist thing. This is not a. This is not some criminal in his basement printing guns. Right. It's not It's not practical. It's and not it's practical. Not Maybe it will be, then we can talk about it. But right now, right. it's not It's not a right. reasonable alternative. Right. Thank you for the corrections. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thank Have a good you. one. Take care. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> you hear enough on talk radio about this kind of thing. I, don't, I kind of like to make this show be the respite from day-to-day -day political talk. Uh, but sometimes politics and technology do uh, coincide. And what we were talking about last hour was... Actually, it was in the first hour, wasn't it? Um, uh, caller asked, well, what is this? Uh, you know, this is now apparently legal to uh, 3D print a gun and to distribute plans for it. And uh, I explained why. I don't think that's that's an issue at all of public safety at all. Line one, Dean, Act in California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Dean. Hey, Leo. Great to talk to you again. Great to talk to you. So I've got a question. Um, we're thinking that we might need a new cable modem router because everything is so slow now. I know you always say you should upgrade them every couple of years. And everyone's complaining we're slow with all the equipment we've got to, um, attached to it from TCL, Roku TV. That's the problem, right? It's not that the routers have gotten bad. It's just that we're using more and more Wi-Fi all the time. Now, you said yeah. something I don't – I want to – my suggestion – would be get a separate cable modem and a separate router. The cable modem is going to be specced by your cable company. You see what they allow, uh, and you can get one of theirs. Get It should be the standard you're looking for is DOCSIS, D-O-C-S-I-S-3 or better. There is a 3.1 out. Uh, if you want to overbuy for the future, get a 3.1. But all cable companies right now are Do DOCSIS 3, at, at no better than DOCSIS okay. 3. Uh, my favorite, uh, I use ARIS, A-R-R-I-S, all the time. The wire cutter likes the new Netgear CM500. That's 60 bucks. That's separate. Connect that to a router. And the reason you want to separate them is you want to, the router is the thing you want to keep upgrading. You want it to automatically update. You want to separate cable modem from router, in my opinion. Now, router purchase is a little more complicated. So hang on the line. We have to take a break for news at the top of the hour. But I, I think this is something we've covered pretty thoroughly on the show. I'll, I'll give you the outline in just a second. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So um, the reason there's no flat 
recommendation for routers. I'm not mad. I just talked to him in a minute. You'll hear me in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, 40 seconds after the... But we're still on... I'm on the, uh, on the phone with you still. Yeah. Uh, I already talked to him once. Uh, hello? 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 Yeah. All right. I guess he, he figures... I guess I'm done. He thought I was done with him. I'm not. But you know, who? But what? What radio host gives you extra time off the air? Nobody does that. I always do that. You like the Rapture GT AC fifty three hundred? Asus makes good routers. I like them. The problem with routers is that no, the recommendation really varies depending on how you on your use case. So everybody's got a different use case. Uh, I'm tired. You know, I shouldn't do a spin class right before the show. <laughs> it takes me takes me all morning to recover. Yeah, Mike hates it when I say you should get a new router. 2012, six years old. Come on, there's new technologies out there. What kind of what router do you have, Mike B? Yeah, PF Sense is great. If you're smart enough, if you know enough to set up a PF Sense router, you go, you good. Um, it depends on the new router. Eero says they will be software upgradable WPA3. So that tells me if you have enough horsepower. I think that's the condition it's not a particular hardware requirement you just have to have a fast enough processor uh you'll be able to upgrade a wpa3 that means a lot of older routers like that crappy rc rtac 68r you got there will not be upgradable to uh wpa3 so that would be a, a case where you might want to get a wpa3 router I think actually those Asus's have extra length, uh, have extra life because the Asus WRT um, is based on DDWRT, and Asus seems to keep that up to date. So you're probably right. As long as your router is not worn out, it's probably fine. Well, hey, hey, hey! How are you today, Leo Laporte? Here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones. Smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. 888-827-5536. That's toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. And we encourage you to call and ask questions, make comments, make suggestions. It's just a conversation. We're just talking about tech. The website, techguylabs.com, has uh, links to everything I mention on the air. That's where, can, we, can we stick stuff there so that you don't have to write it down? <clears throat> and that is uh, free, no sign-up, no subscription required, techguylabs.com. Uh, Routers, it, it, our caller, last caller of the hour asked a, a question uh, that I get asked a lot. What's the best router? And it's kind of like saying, what's the best computer? I mean, there isn't a best computer. Uh, there's a best computer for you. There's a best router for you. But it's for you. And so there's no blanket. I can't say uh, with a blanket recommendation that, oh, well, everyone should just get this and be done with it. I wish I could. That would be a lot easier. But really, as always, you kind of have to ask some questions about how you're going to use it, uh, you know, what your issues are, why you, why you want a new router, what Wi-Fi issues you have. There are a couple of basic things you must have, in my opinion, uh, in a router. And if your router doesn't currently have this, you should get a new router probably. And at least if you're getting a new router, you should make sure that your new router has a few features. Number one on the list is uh, over-the-air firmware upgrades. And I know that maybe that's a, that's a little confusing phrase, but you already have that on your phone, right? Your phone automatically updates. You have it on your laptop on your desktop your computer automatically updates sometimes it'll say uh, the phone usually does hey i've got updates do you want to update now and you say yes but th and that's fine but you want these updates pushed to you automatically most routers 
until recently, you just never updated it. And if, if you were having problems, you, it's like the BIOS updates on older computers, which, by the way, are also now over the air automated. And in the old days, you'd say, oh, let me see if there's any update to the firmware on the router. Huh. No, you can't do that anymore because routers are the first thing, the one thing that you have sitting on the public Internet. That means they're the bearing the brunt of all the Internet attacks. There's constant attacks going on against these routers. Yes, your router. Because things like WannaCry, you know, that's the ransomware. Uh, these are called network worms because once they're on a machine, then they go out and try to infect other machines. And they become part of what my friend Steve Gibson calls internet background radiation. It's just constantly going on. There's a virus out there that was, we believe, created by the Russians. Uh, we're not sure why. We think maybe they're trying to use it to for cyber warfare. It's called VPN filter. You remember the, a couple of months ago, the FBI said everybody should reboot their routers. <laughs> That's because this, uh, this malware VPN filter lived in the memory of your router. And if you turned it off, you know, unplugged it and plugged it in again, it would clear it out of the memory. It wasn't exactly the right advice the FBI gave because it turned out that they could still get reinfected even if you rebooted it. Really, the only real fix for this kind of stuff is a firmware upgrade. That the, so it requires you to buy a router from, A, a manufacturer that's going to keep tabs on that software and update it regularly, and B, push it out to you because you can't be expected to go out and check. It's not your job. You, the router should uh, automatically update itself. And I would not buy, these days, I would not buy a router that doesn't. It's just, uh, it's just too darn uh, risky. In fact, I would extend that to say anything that goes on the Internet should be updated automatically. That's why Windows and Macintosh and Android and iOS are all updated automatically nowadays. It's just table stakes. It's just the base requirement. So if your router is not uh, updating automatically, well, get one that does. And if you're buying a new router, get one that does. So that's the first question you should ask. There is a, a newer standard. It turns out the you know, every router, of course, and any decent modern router will have the ability to uh, put a password on the router. And what's actually happening there is it's encrypting its traffic. It's scrambling it. It gets descrambled with the password. That's important so that somebody who's in your vicinity can't snoop on what you're doing and can't join your network. So I hope that if you have a Wi-Fi router, you've turned on password protection in general, it should be WPA2. And that's because the original password protection built into routers, WEP, was very badly designed and has been cracked. Turns out now WPA2 is pretty vulnerable. If you, if you don't use a good password, it's not so hard to crack. So if you're using WPA2, don't use a... And I do this. I, 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 I'm going to change my ways. For a long time, I thought, well... It doesn't matter how good a password I use on that. No, it does, turns out. So use a good password. Because what can happen now, with even with WPA2, is somebody, they still need to be able to see your Wi-Fi. They need to get it close enough, sit on your curb or whatever, to get a bunch of packets. But they can download those packets, then go home and run a brute force cracker on them and get your Wi-Fi password. Now, nobody's going to do that to you. Why would anybody care that much? Right? So you're probably okay. But if you really want to be secure, use a long, strong password. That means it's very hard for them to brute force it. They can't crack it easily, even if they take it home and work on it for days and weeks and months. It can't get into it. If you use monkey123, they'll be into it in a couple hours. <laughs> Maybe not even that long. So use a good password. WPA3 does not have this vulnerability. It's been announced it will be coming. And a modern router, a router you buy today, should be WPA3 compatible if it has a fast enough processor. So those are all things to keep in mind. You would like a router that can be firmware upgraded to WPA3 if possible. That'll give you more security. But it's not the end of the world if it doesn't. WPA2 is good enough if you use a nice, long, strong password. So what else should you look for in a router? Well, there are other considerations that may or may not be important. I usually like a router that is tri-band. 
So you remember the early Wi-Fi routers were 802.11b. That was at the 2.4 gigahertz band. There have been new updates to that, and then we're now at 802.11ac, and it can use both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And in fact, there are two different segments of the 5 gigahertz band that it can use. So that's a tri-band router. It uses 2.4 gigahertz and high and low 5 gigahertz. Why do you want three bands? Well, because in many cases, congestion is a problem these days. Not only are you using many devices, but so is your neighbor. Your neighbor's Wi-Fi is overpowering your Wi-Fi. One of the things, one of the problems with Wi-Fi is it's a collision-based network, which means if your Wi-Fi router starts sending data and, and your neighbor's Wi-Fi router starts sending data, your router will go, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, and stop for a random amount of time before it begins again. Two different Wi-Fi routers can't talk on the same frequency at the same time. So one will stop and politely wait for the other to finish. This is probably not what you want. Probably not what you want. So my suggestion is uh, <laughs> get a, a tri-band router. You're much more likely to be able to find a frequency that isn't stepped on by your neighbor. What about those mesh routers? Well, they're very expensive, but often they work well for people who are having problems because either they have so many devices attached to their Wi-Fi or more likely because they're so spread out. One Wi-Fi unit will cover about 1,500 square feet. If you have a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot house or more, you might need a extender. And that's what Mesh does particularly well. The other side of Mesh, and there are a lot of Mesh routers now. Eero, our sponsor, is one. But there's Plume. There's Velop. Uh, there's, I mean, I can go on and on and on. There are a lot of manufacturers that make these. The other advantage of those is, in every case, they are over-the-air updatable. That's one of the things Wi-Fi Mesh routers do, is they constantly get updates so that they work better on your network. It's one of the reasons you pay a little more for them. But you may not need it. If you have a small area, you're not having problems with Wi-Fi, you just want, you know, maybe a little better speed or a little more modern router with better security, you probably can just get a simple Wi-Fi router. I often send people to the wirecutter.com, and the main reason I do that is because they have very good router reviews, and they review a large variety, and they make recommendations that I think are reliable and trustworthy. The wirecutter.com. You can at least get a sense of what's out there. And uh, that's why I don't say one router for all. There isn't one router to rule them all. It really depends on what you need. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a little tiny, teeny, weeny, itsy, bitsy break. We'll be back. And I'll take more of your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Maurice in Claremont, California. You're next. Hi, Maurice. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I use Microsoft, and I use Outlook for my email. Yes, sir. About, about five, six months ago, all my email addresses disappeared. So we went back out to try to find them, and I got somebody locally here to really move everything over to a new computer. And uh, But I've never been able to get my group emails. In other words, where I, one, one was called the Rinky Dink. A bunch of people that I've known asked that I could send an email to all of them at once. I call it a group email. So your entire address book disappeared. Your entire address book disappeared. What disappeared? I when I go to go to put somebody in. Uh, yeah, uh, I got the auto complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I carbonite would be able to take care of it, and carbonite. Uh, said, sure, we can bring back on, but they could put these back on. Yeah, so there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, when you say you use Outlook... For are, my emails. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Are you using Outlook, the program, uh, the Microsoft Office program? No idea. Are you using Outlook.com? I'm, I, I have no idea. It's just yeah. up on my... So this is going to be hard for me my, to help you because you don't... Um, you're not, you don't know what's going on. 
And so I, I know what's going on, but I have to get some information from you in order to help you. So what happens with Outlook uh, when you start typing an email address, it starts making suggestions. That's autocomplete. It, it does that by looking at your contact, your address book, your contact list. So the question I am asking is, where is your contact list? Because if that's intact, then probably those groups are still intact as well. So you've been relying on, and this is not unusual, um, you've been relying on a feature of whichever you're using, and it's not clear what you're using, to automatically, when you start type, typing rinky-dink, you know, R-I-N, it says, oh, a rinky-dink group, and fills that in. That got broken. There's a lot of ways uh, that that can get broken. But it, the reason Carbonite doesn't back up things like autocomplete, because that's not really data. That's just a feature of whatever program you're using. Um, unfortunately, I, I, it's hard for me to help you uh, if you can't answer some basic questions about what you're doing. So I'm just going to have to leave it at, if you're using the Outlook program, go look in your address book, which is part of the Outlook program, and see if the addresses are there. There may even be a, uh, a group set up there, and if that's the case, if the Rinky Duke group is there, then you're, then you're good. You've still got all the data. You just need to get Outlook autocomplete to recognize it. Now, I'm not sure why autocomplete started, stopped working. My fear, however, is that if, if, your, if your address book is gone, then it can't autocomplete because it can't find anything. So there, the, and again, this is hard for me to answer if you don't know what email client you're using, but there is in Outlook the program, <laughs> if you're using that, there is an autocomplete list. And um, the autocomplete list can be enabled, and it may have been disabled, if you go in the menu, go to File and Options, and select the Mail tab. And then as you scroll down uh, under the Send Messages section, there's a checkbox that says Use Autocomplete list to suggest names when typing that's what you used that's what you want if that's unchecked then it won't do it anymore now that's in the more modern outlook outlook 2010 2013 and 2016 if you're and since you can't even tell me if you're using outlook i don't know if you're using it and i don't know what version older versions there is, it's it, it, under advanced email options, another a checkbox that says suggest names. If that's unchecked, that's all that happened. It went away, and you're still capable of doing that. I'm hoping that's all it is. Uh, you can, in fact, export. In fact, if you, get your, if you can find your autocomplete list, you, could, you might want to save it to back it up. Then Carbonite would back it up. It's not backing up Outlook uh, settings. But it would back it up as a, as a um, as an application, and in order to do that, you need to. <laughs> uh, this may be way too complicated. I wish Microsoft hadn't made this so complicated, but it is. There's a program called MFCMAPI.exe that will let you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> I will though. Uh, there is a support tech note from Microsoft two one nine nine two two six. That's what I'm looking at right now. I will put that in the show notes. Uh, God bless you. Good luck. Uh, if you can figure out what they're saying in there, I don't know if I can. Uh, you can you can help them. Um, Carbonite will back up data, right? But it won't back up settings, really. And so I think that's I think that's kind of fundamentally the uh, issue here. But again, because uh, I don't know what you're using, I don't know how to help you exactly. There's out, and, and that's by no way not your fault. I'm not blaming you. Uh, Microsoft has completely confused everybody. They had Outlook Express, got rid of that, replaced that with Live Mail, which they've gotten rid of now, and they have Mail. Maybe you're calling that Outlook. There's also the Outlook based uh, Outlook website, Outlook.com, which is email from Microsoft. Maybe you're talking about that. Maybe you're talking about Outlook, the big boy program that comes with Microsoft Office. That's the answer I gave you, but maybe that's not what you're talking about. So, 
I'm sorry that I can't be more helpful. Leo Laporte, <laughs> the tech guy. <sighs> it makes me sad, really. Microsoft is not notorious for making this stuff easy. That's all I can say. Your outlook is dim. I don't know what to say. Um, what's the answer, though? You know, if somebody, uh, most people don't know how computers work, and they can't answer those questions. So should they be using Windows at all? That's always been my contention. No. No, you shouldn't be using Windows at all. Uh, you should be using an iPad. You should be using, at most, a Chromebook. But a general purpose operating system like Macintosh or Windows is so fraught with complexity that it shouldn't be used by anybody who is not a geek. Backup doesn't help this. That autocomplete list is not a file. It's, it's probably stored in the registry. You don't back up the registry. <sighs> where does where does Microsoft store it? Outlook. But see, since I couldn't even get from him the name, what really he's using, I don't know what he's using. So I don't even know. I everything I've said may be completely meaningless. I know it's completely meaningless. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, Outlook autocomplete list location. Let's see where it is. All right. Looks like it's stored. Ah, the autocomplete list of feature displays and has suggestions for names and addresses as you begin to type them. The rinky-dink list is stored. Wait a minute, no. Oh, Lord. I got to show you this because it's so ridiculous. The method to copy your autocomplete list from one computer to another depends on what type of AOMail account you've added to Outlook. If you have an Office 365 account, Exchange Server account, or an IMAP account, then the autocomplete list is stored as a hidden file. That's why it wasn't backed up by Carbonite in your Outlook data file. If you have a POP3 account, your autocomplete list is... So what am I going to ask the guy? Well, is it IMAP or POP3? Is stored in an NK2 file. If you don't know what type of account you have... <laughs> <laughs> oh, edit, exit Outlook, close the Outlook web access or Outlook web app on all workstations that are connected to your mailbox. Download and install, and I mentioned this, the MFC MAPI from codeplex.com. Run MFC API. By the way, you'll have to do that from a command line. On the location session menu, click log on. If you're prompted for a profile, select the desired profile name, then click OK. In the top pane, locate the line that corresponds to your mailbox, then double-click it. The guy doesn't even know what program he's running. Can he do this? Oh, and by the way, yeah, it depends what version of Office you're running <laughs> and whether you're using Exchange Server IMAP. I'm hoping his contact list is not gone. But why does, I mean, this is such a, a fragile system. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO, the uh, phone number, if you have a question, a comment, or suggestion. I, uh, I admit, it's true, I can't help everybody, uh, and I'm sorry, I apologize. In the early days of uh, automobiles, I'm talking 1910, when you bought an automobile... Uh, it would typically come with a person <laughs> who would keep it running, drive it for you, and you might even also have a flag person to walk ahead of you with a red flag so the horses wouldn't get scared. Now, as time went by, automobiles got easier, safer, you, 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 you know. In fact, there was a period of time in my youth when you could even fix it yourself. Now, of course, you can't. You can't change your own oil. You can't change your spark plugs you can't tune a car up anymore you need to bring it to the shop where they've got a computer but at least you don't have to have somebody <laughs> that comes with the car to keep it running unfortunately in some cases with computing we're back in that era that there are things that you might rely on on your computer like this autocomplete 
that our last caller had with his rinky-dink list. Uh, and you rely on it and it works fine until it doesn't. Then <laughs> you're kind of uh, at sea, right? What are you going to do? You didn't come with a guy. So you bring it to a guy, but sometimes a guy can help you. A guy like me can help you if I could get to your computer and sit down in front of it and figure out for myself the answers to some of the questions I was asking that you couldn't answer, like which program you're using for email. That's kind of fundamental. If you don't know that, I can't really lead you in the right direction. I'm going to put some links in the show notes to, to Microsoft's help files, and you'll see how ridiculous this is. This is insane. Here's Microsoft's page uh, on the office.com site for importing or copying the autocomplete list to another computer. This is, I think, when our caller's problems began. He moved to another computer, but the autocomplete didn't come with him. Oh, well, that's easy. The method I'm reading from Microsoft. The method to copy your autocomplete list from one computer to another depends on what type of email account you've added to Outlook. If you have an Office 365 account, Exchange Server account, or an IMAP account, then the autocomplete list is stored as a hidden file in your Outlook data file. See the copy the autocomplete list for instructions. If you have a POP3 account, your autocomplete list is stored in a file stored on your computer. See copy and import an NK2 file. If you don't know what type of account you have, you're just out of luck. Well, that, that's me editorializing. We've made this so complicated. This is not this is not normal user land. And the problem is autocomplete is really great and really useful and people rely on it, right? You start typing uh, the first few names of the recipient, you don't have to remember their email address, it just fills it in for you. But do you know how it works? Do you know where it's stored? Do you know how to back it up? No, and if it's a hidden file, Carbonite won't back it up because it's hidden. Uh, it's not fully Microsoft's fault, but the problem is really this stuff's all designed by engineers. Geeks who love this stuff. They, 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 they read a paragraph like that and they go, oh, yeah, well, I happen to be using an IMAP server. Uh, and I know where the hidden data file is. I know how to unhide that and back it up. I'm going to just go do that. The rest of us go, huh? If you don't even know what program you're using, I can't ask you if you're using an IMAP or POP3 account. <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> so this is the problem. We've kind of painted ourselves into a corner here. We've got technology that was invented in the 60s, 70s by engineers for engineers that has somehow, unfortunately, migrated its way into your house. And it's not just your computer. It's your network devices, your switches, and your routers. Whoever thought you'd have to know how a router works? It's It's everything. And it's all hanging by a thread. And if something should go wrong, good luck in fixing it. You have to find that guy that came with the car who, <laughs> who knows how to fix it. And by the way, how do you know who can do that? Because frankly, if you go out and you go to the Geek Squad or you go to the Genius Bar or you go wherever, your chances are only about 50-50. And heaven help you if you have to make a phone call to India. That guy doesn't even know anything. All he's got is a notebook, and he hopes it's in the in the notebook somewhere, and he can read it to you. So this explains why I'm often telling people, don't buy a computer, please, please, don't buy a computer. For years, that's all you could do, right? Don't buy a computer. And there's people like me who love computers. I love them. I love figuring this stuff out. I live for this. <sighs> We bathe in the warm glow of the green screen and the command line interface. That's good. F that's, that's meat. The rest of the world is going, what? <laughs> that's why, uh, frankly, iPhones are so successful and apps are so successful and simplicity is, is the key. And uh, even then, you're going to run into stuff you just can't fix. But So generally, for most people, I would just say get an iPad. You know, you can do email on an iPad. Uh, you can't fix anything, but 
things are simpler and they're probably not going to break anyway and and you don't even ever have any expectation you can fix it the problem with you look at a windows pc you feel like you could fix it <laughs> you can't you can't fix it or yeah i guess i mean your other option is to become a, a geek to learn you should see my bookshelves loaded hundreds and hundreds more like a thousand volumes of the most geeky arcana and i've been studying it for 40 years now and i still run into stuff where ah, i can't i don't know what's going on get an ipad get a, a you know a chromebook really good choice really good choice we're seeing we're seeing solutions to this uh but we're still kind of in the in the muck but what you probably should not be doing, nobody should be doing, unless you want to become a geek, unless you want to get that eight-foot shelf and start reading and studying, is get a Windows PC or a Mac PC, you know, a Mac OS device. Those are really complicated. They have to be. They're general-purpose devices designed to do anything the owner wants to do. I think that's great. I like it. <laughs> but it also, along with that, comes a significant amount of complexity. And, you know, I think we've sold it. The, the, partly, the computer industry's made made this hard because they've sold it like, yeah, it's easy. Anybody could do it. Oh, no problem. Go get you get a Windows PC and go to the go to the cloud. Everything's beautiful in the cloud. And it'd be like um, Steinway selling a piano saying, hey, just sit down and play a Mozart sonata. You're going to love it. No. You're going to suck. You're going to. You're going to sit down and it's going to go blonk, blonk, blonk. And you're going to have to take some lessons for many years before you play that sonata. It's going to take a little while. So that's your choice. Do you want to be a geek? Okay, get a Windows PC. Start reading. Start studying. Take some classes. Get some friends. It's really helpful to get a group of friends who understand this stuff because that's how I learned. You learn from other people. Um, I don't... I, I, I honestly, I, I don't know what to say, except if, if you're not willing to do that, then you probably should get an iPad. Honestly, get an iPad. That's the computer for the rest of us, really. In fact, it's pretty clear that's the computer Apple always wanted to make. The technology wasn't there until 2010. We, they tried, but they just couldn't make that computer. They tried with the Newton. They tried with the General Magic Magic Link. We've tried for decades in Silicon Valley to make an easy-to-use computer. They just The hardware and software wasn't sophisticated enough. Ironically, that's what it takes to make an easy-to-use computer. Now it is. The chips are fast enough. There's lots of memory. Software design has gotten better. And I think you can get a device that's easy to use. It's called an iPad. <laughs> and uh, heaven help you if you get a Windows machine. I'll try my best. 8888-ASK-LEO. I'm sorry. I'm a little frustrated. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I want to help, but I can't. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK. Leo Carl, Savannah, Georgia. Leo Laporte here. Hey, hey Carl. Leo. Hello, welcome. Hey, thanks. Um, I have a at and DSL internet service, mm -hmm. and they're currently upgrading my neighborhood to uh, fiber internet. Should be finished in about two or three weeks. Oh, how exciting. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it. And my question is... Um, well, this might be a solution for one of your earlier callers. Like last week, I heard you talking about routers and and, and AT and T equipment. I had the same problem that gentleman had, where he had to keep resetting his AT and T modem to get his wireless to work correctly. <laughs> and what and what I discovered was the internal wireless radios in that thing that they provide you with is basically just garbage. So I found that you could disable those internal radios and you could use your own router. That's it's always the best solution. Right. Now, now when when now when people know when I say, oh, don't buy a modem router combo, get a modem and a router separately. The problem is when you go to AT and T, that's what they provide you with. So, right. is it easy to disable those radios, or do I have to open up the box? No, you don't have to open up the box. It's this, if you just go on Google and type, how do I disable it? Or actually, an easier expression: How do I? use an external router with my AT&T modem. And the, and the is there a way to put the AT&T modem, turn off the, 
Wi-Fi from the, from like a web page configuration uh, to do right, it? That's, exactly, that's okay. exactly how you do it. You just log into it like you log into a router, put the IP address in there, yeah. put your password, put the AT&T password in there, the device password, which is on a sticker, and it'll let you, it'll, it's just like three lines. Yeah. You know, this is this is of course the solution. Anytime you get a bundled modem router, if the best thing you could do is disable the Wi-Fi router part, just use it as a cable modem and buy your own router, which is right. almost certainly going to be more sophisticated, easier to configure, so, and more modern than the one that is provided to you by the ISP. Unfortunately, many ISPs do not allow you to do that. I, for instance, have a Comcast right. modem router. Uh, it's not a Wi-Fi router. It's a hardwired router that I cannot put into bridge mode. I have to use. Uh, and so a lot of ISPs would prefer. And by the way, the reason they want you to use their router is because that's how they can control your Internet use. They can right. gate it. They can slow it down. They can uh, throttle it. There's all sorts of things they can do with that. And if you're using your own router, they usually don't have that kind of capability. So there's there's reasons why ISPs require it. I'm thrilled to hear that AT&T does not, uh, that you can yeah, use your those, own. All, all those problems I had went away when I started yeah. using my own router. Yeah. Now, my question, the reason I called you today, I have a, a router I bought last summer, like a sixty dollar router. Mm -hmm. But I heard one I heard the tail end of one of your shows not too long ago where you were talking about these new routers that are coming out with the Mimu or Mimo technology. And I was wondering, is it worth the investment to buy one of those since I'm since they're upgrading my Well new is your router is your router working okay? It works okay, but I mean I'm getting ready to go from twenty megs a second to a thousand megs a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in general Wi Fi doesn't obviously hit that, you know, nominal top speed usually it's about right. half of that right even ethernet won't uh right. because there's overhead ethernet will get you pretty close usually 90 percent wi-fi usually is more like 60 percent of nominal speed sure so as long as you understand that um and don't expect to get you know a gigabit wi-fi <laughs> uh the one reason you might want to get a newer router yeah mimo is one way one way to speed up your router you want uh, certainly to have 802.11 ac i'm sure you do by now that's the latest standard right there, there are levels of AC, though. There's, for instance, beam forming that is a fairly sophisticated capability that most AC routers don't do, but some do. If you could do beam forming, what that does is it says, I'm going to kind of aim the signal at the device that's using me. <laughs> and by doing that, I can increase the speed dramatically. So there are lots of techniques and tricks built into 802.11 AC that uh, some more sophisticated routers could take advantage of. It's interesting. A lot of times the mesh routers I talk about do not give you the highest throughput. And there's a reason for that. They, and this is why you may not always want to have the maximum throughput. Uh, what you really want is enough for everything. So uh, having a router that is smart enough to say, look, you're watching Netflix. You don't need more than 25 megabits a second. So that's what I'm going to give you so that the uh, the computer down the hall can download at faster speed. That's kind of more what you want, which is intelligent routing. And that may not always give you the highest speed. The best mesh router for speed that I know of is the uh, Netgear Orbi. If you are looking at a mesh router, that's the one I'd look at. Everybody agrees that that gives you the highest individual speed. But again, that's not always what you want. What you really want is a system that is balanced, right? Do you understand the difference? Yeah, what, but what I notice is the 50 and $60 routers seem to be going away. Yeah, there, nobody's. That. Yeah, you go to the even if you go to Best Buy, they start at two hundred dollars. I was shocked, frankly. Right, yeah. and that's why I was calling you. I was wondering what's going on with routers. I, you know, what? Well, there's two theories. My theory is the router manufacturers said, "Hey, if everybody's going to be charging three hundred bucks, I'm not charging sixty bucks." That's one theory, just greed. But the other theory is that those forty dollar and fifty dollar Linksys routers that Cisco was selling were so bad. And so insecure and never updated, because why would they update it? They made $2 on it in profit that uh, people just stopped buying them. They're really crappy routers. So maybe that's what happened is the market pushed these companies to actually start making decent hardware and decent software. Uh, I, I would really read reviews before you choose a router. And as I said at the beginning of the hour, a lot of what you choose is going to depend on your use case. All right. Do you have a lot of devices on your internet? 
maybe three or four. I watch Netflix and I got to... Yeah, three or four. See, I have 62. So my needs are very different than yours. In fact, for me, a mesh router makes sense because I want it to be smart about who gets what. With you, you probably do want maximum throughput. An Orbi probably would be a good choice for you because you want that PC to get, you know, at least 600 megabits on that gigabit connection. And what kind of price range do those sell for? Uh, they're a little pricey. We're talking 299 to start. Usually that's uh, for the base station and one or two substations. In the case of the Orbi, it's the base plus one. Um, the, the, I think that's usually enough. How, how many square feet are you covering? Uh, 1,500. Oh, then just get the base unit. Uh, that Orbi tri-band base unit, their newest base unit, is actually fairly cheap, $129.99. Orbi, yeah. like all the mesh, is automatically updated. It is very fast. It is something I don't normally recommend to people because uh, more people, most people have many devices and they want a more balanced system. But in your case, you want maximum speed. Right. So uh, I think the Orbi, I mean, Wi-Fi is never going to give you a gigabit. But the Orbi comes with four gigabit Ethernet ports. So when you want the fastest speed, you can always hardwire. And it sure. will give you the fastest uh, Wi-Fi speed as well. That's, right. well, that's my recommendation for you. And for anything under 2,000 square feet, one is enough. All right. Well, I sure appreciate the info. That's the net gear. My pleasure. Uh, and a lot of people, if you're a hobbyist, an enthusiast, absolutely take a look at the ASUS, ASUS routers using ASUS WRT. They are easily modified. You can get third-party firmware for them. ASUS does a really good job with the firmware. I think they have some very nice features like QoS. For a serious hardcore hobbyist, uh, that, another good choice would be the Asus. That's one where you got a lot of settings. You can go into it. You can do all sorts of things. You can manually do what a mesh router does or tries to do automatically. And since you know your network better than anyone, you probably do a better job if you do it manually. Thanks, Michael Cozio, our musical director. Kim Schaffer for answering the phones. Thanks most especially to you for joining me. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Have a great Geek Week. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.